We're going to focus on the cross of Christ right now. Do you have your Bible open to Luke chapter 20? Um, I want you to put your finger on verse 44. Show me your index finger. First of all, do you have a functioning index finger? Show me that index finger. I want you to put your finger on verse 44. Everybody find that in your Bible here. Now, without removing your finger, I want you to close your Bible. Everybody got that? All right, show me what you got. Show me what you got. Here's what I got. You got it right there? All right, now listen. If you're holding the Bible like me, here's what I want you to understand about the significance of what we're about to read. Everything under your finger was written to prepare you for what we're about to read in verse 44. Everything on top of your finger, everything that comes after verse 44 is nothing but an exclamation and an explanation about the significance of verse 44. Now, have I got your attention yet? What we're about to read is the most important thing in all of human history and all that is in the Bible. Everything that was written before it was predicting it, and everything written after it was trying to explain it. What we're going to read about today is the cross of Christ. And the simple message is this, the cross of Christ saves. We're going to hear a message about the cross of Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us about how important it is. It says this, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, how many of you, that's you, you're, you're being saved. Anybody in here being saved? Is, is that what you're working on? Listen, if you are being saved, then what we're about to read about the cross of Christ is the power of God. Did you need a little extra power this week? Did anybody need a little extra power not to fear, not to worry, not to get angry, not to get frustrated? Could you lose, use a little extra power going into this week to resist sin, to be gracious with your words? Any, anybody, any husbands in here need a little more power to love your wife as Christ loves the church? Yeah, I don't know about you. I'm that kind of husband. I need some more power. Do you know where that power comes from? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it comes from the word of of the cross. I want you to notice what Luke is telling us in verse 44. Now remember last week we left Jesus hanging on a cross between two criminals. One of those criminals mocked him and railed at him. The other criminal asked him if he would allow him into the kingdom of Christ and Jesus miraculously granted him access into the kingdom. And that chapter closed on the cross of Christ. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 44 what the Scripture tells us. In verse 44, we're going to learn two things. First of all, we're going to learn how the cross of Christ saves. Verse 44 says this, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour hour, while the sun's light failed. Now, Luke gives us a time clock here. Their hours weren't like our hours. We, we talk about we get up at 6 a.m., and then it's noon, and then dinner's about 6 p.m., and then we go to bed at whatever hour you go to bed. They measured hours by what time the sun came up, and it came up, and then six hours later, if it came up at 6, in the sixth hour, what time was that? It was high noon. Now, we're told that Jesus was nailed to the cross on the, at, the, at the third hour, which would have been 9 a.m. So everything that we've read previously has taken place as Jesus is hung on the cross for the three hours before noon, from 9 a.m. until noon. But at noon, something changed. Up until that time, for the past three hours, Jesus has been unjustly treated by evil men. But at noon, at the sixth hour, 
Jesus is now going to be treated as if he was a sinner by a loving, holy God. Apart from verse 44, Jesus died like every other convicted criminal. But in verse 44, God takes center stage. God shows up. He ushers all the other characters at the cross to the background and God steps forward. From noon until three o'clock, Jesus is going to absorb the wrath, the fury, the hatred, and the judgment of a holy God on unholy sin. God the Father is now beginning to treat Jesus as if he committed every sin of every person who would ever believe so he could treat every person who ever believes as if they had never sinned. The Bible tells us that this strange event happens. Darkness covers the land. I used to read that and think, well, you know, it's probably kind of like Michiana in January. You know, the sun never shines. It's just kind of a permacloud. It just probably got dim. Nope, that's not what it says. Or other people would say, well, it's probably an eclipse happened. You know, maybe there's an eclipse. Nope, that, that was impossible because the Passover around which this whole event takes place is set by the full moon. And you can't have a full moon. You can't have an eclipse when there's a full moon. And so there was this supernatural darkness that descended on this scene. Now remember, their darkness was different than our darkness. I don't know about you. I, I got up in the middle of the night last night. I looked outside at like three o'clock and I saw the lights. There, there were, there, there's electricity and the lights from the city were bouncing off the cloud and it was not really all that dark out there. They had no electricity. At this point, there was no moonlight shining. There were no stars shining. It was pitch black for three hours around the cross. What kind of darkness was this? The people at the cross would have instinctively recognized this as the divine judgment of God. You see, the cross saves us by absorbing God's judgment. Supernatural darkness was associated with divine judgment. You and I are accustomed to thinking of God as light. And there's scripture to support that. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. He told the church, you are the light of the world. The Bible opens up with God speaking into the darkness saying, let there be light. But darkness signified the holy righteous judgment of God. Let me prove it to you. In Psalm chapter 97, verse 2, the scripture says, clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. In Exodus chapter 20, when God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses up on Mount Sinai, there were clouds and thick darkness surrounded it. The Israelites, the Jews at the base of the mountain would look up and see lightning and hear thunder and they were very afraid and they even begged Moses, don't let God speak to us. We're afraid of him. And Moses finally said, the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. In Joel chapter 2, the prophet is predicting the day of the Lord, the final judgment, when the fury and the wrath of God comes upon the earth for all wickedness and evil. Listen to the way that Joel describes it. The day of the Lord is coming, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Again, Zephaniah, another prophet, predicting the day of the Lord. Near is the great day of the Lord. It will be a day of wrath. It will be a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Some of you may have wondered, is 2020 the, the day of the judgment of the Lord? Listen, if it is, there will be no doubt when it happens. 
because all of the light will go out as God exercises his judgment on all that is evil. What was happening in this three-hour time period when there was darkness as Jesus hung on that cross? He was absorbing the divine judgment of an angry God on sin. Listen, Jesus often taught on hell. Did you know that Jesus taught on hell more than he taught on heaven? So if you believe in heaven, I would ask you why. He's like, well, Jesus taught about it. It's like, well, do you believe in hell? Because he taught about hell more than he talked about heaven. And Jesus described hell as a place of outer darkness. Now, some people have been confused. Like, did Jesus die and go to hell and suffer God's wrath and hell? No, the Bible does say that he went to hell, but not to suffer. He went there to proclaim his victory. Jesus didn't go to hell to suffer. God the Father brought hell to Jesus on the cross, and he suffered the weight of God's fury. Listen, until your theology embraces a God of judgment and wrath and anger and hatred against all that is evil and all that is wicked, the cross will have no power for you. But when you understand that the cross diverted the anger and the wrath and the fury of a holy God, and because Jesus absorbed that judgment, you are loved and set free and proclaimed righteous in Christ. Now the cross is the power to live in a world that is full of darkness, knowing you're loved by a holy angry God against all that is unrighteous, and yet it's been diverted because of the love and the grace and the mercy of the cross of Christ. So how does the cross save? Let me give you some doctrinal terms. These are some things like, you know, I told you if you keep reading the rest of your Bible, it's just simply explaining what happened at this point in that three-hour period of history. What, what was ha- How did the cross save? The cross saves through penal, just, uh, penal substitution. This is the foundational understanding of why we are secure in Christ, and we do not have to fear the judgment of God. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for our sake, He, God the Father, made Him... God the Son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The question I would have for you is this, are you in Him? Because God the Father treated God the Son as if He was me, God the Father can now treat me as if I had lived as righteous as Him. That's what we call penal substitutionary atonement, and it produces a heart of worship. Here's another wonderful term. It's the term redemption. The cross saves us through redemption. Notice Galatians chapter 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. I've told you before, the most important word in the Bible is a little three-letter word, for. You see, the cross accomplished something. The cross didn't just provide a way for people to somehow get saved. The cross accomplished something for me. There was a transaction that took place on the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Ephesians chapter 1 says it this way. Justin read it earlier. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption is all about a purchase. You see, there was a cost for our sin. Out of the riches of the grace of Christ, he paid the purchase price. He 
owns us. He bought us back from the debt of sin. That's the redemption we have in Christ. Here's another great word. Now, you're going to love this one, okay? It's the word propitiation. Everybody just turn to your neighbor right now and say the word propitiation. You do that, you got to spit a little bit to say it, which is not great if you're not social distancing, but propitiation. Now, when you say that word, you sound really spiritual. And then the person looks at you and is like, so what's that mean? And you're like, I don't know. That's why I came to church to learn words like this, okay? So listen, this is an incredible word that's found all throughout the Scripture in 1 John chapter 4. Notice what he says. In this is love. You want to know what the love of God is all about? It's not a sentimental love. It's not a squishy love. God doesn't have romantic feelings for you. You want to know what real love is? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here's what it means. Propitiation is simply the satisfaction of God's holy wrath. You and I, because of our sin, are born into this world as objects of God's wrath. Propitiation, the work of Christ on the cross, it did not just save us from sin. If I ask you, are you saved? And I say, you say yes. And I say, what do you save from? You may say, I'm saved from my sin. Good answer. That's not the complete answer. You are not just saved from sin. You are saved from God's judgment. And propitiation diverts the judgment of God from you to the cross and satisfies the requirement of God's anger. When we understand that God sent His Son, Jesus didn't just come, He was sent by a holy God for a purpose. Not to be a good teacher, not to live a good life, but to die a death that makes propitiation for our sin. And this was planned from before the foundation of the earth. The cross was not God's rescue plan B. Oh my goodness, I created the world and they all just went haywire. What were they thinking? What am I going to do now? I've got to come up with a solution. Oh man, I guess Oh, somehow reluctantly I'm going to have to send my son down there and he's going to really, oh, I don't want to do this. And, uh, no, this was this was designed from eternity past to secure and guarantee the salvation of all for whom it was designed. And so as Jesus was on that cross, he was diverting the wrath and judgment of God for all of us who would one day trust him and believe. When you understand propitiation, it breaks your heart in repentance and then it causes your heart to soar in worship. If you can yawn your way through reading your Bible about the cross, you don't understand propitiation. Here's another great word. You're going to love this one too. Expiation. Turn to your neighbor and say the word expiation. Theologians use this term when we read this verse. He, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Do you know why Jesus came as a human being? Because he needed nerve endings that would feel pain when nails went through them to bear sin on our behalf. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Resurrection always follows death in the scripture. Die to sin, live to righteousness. Then it says this, great verse quoted from the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 that was written 700 years before Jesus died, perfectly describing his crucifixion. Notice this, by his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you have been, past tense, on the cross, healed. 
That's expiation. You see, propitiation focuses on God's satisfaction for sin. Expiation focuses on my cure for sin. Let me put it this way. When I was 13, 14 years old, the, my favorite thing to do every day was to ride my BMX bike. I had a Japanese name made $400 Kuahara racing bike. I was number 4,327 in the national rankings in class Z um, of all the other BMX racers. I like ran one race and I finished next to last. And so I got a point or something. And so I had this bike. Now, I loved to ride this bike and we'd, we'd jump off cliffs, you know, and you'd go off ramps and stuff and you'd wreck, but that was just part of being 13, 14 years old. Now, is there anybody else that had that same experience? Raise your hand if you were a bike rider and you've ever crashed. And it, is there anybody here that actually has scars right here on your shins because of the pedals that the adults figured they should make as spiky as possible so that when you slip a pedal, it would scrape your shins and just take big pieces of meat out of your shins. I have scars on my shins right now from, from wounds that I experienced when I was 13 years old. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody here that has any sin scars from stupid decisions wrong choices, not only things that you did, but sins that were committed against you that other people did just because living in this world, you're going to wreck. People are going to wreck into you. You're going to get wounded. You're going to get hurt. It's unavoidable in this world. We live in a sin-sick world. It causes woundedness. Most of it is self-inflicted. And so here we are today, do you know what expiation does? Expiation heals sin's wounds. Now, without the cross, without going to the cross, without embracing the cross of Christ by faith, your wounds are still open and they're getting infected. And they're going to cause a terminal illness. But because of the cross of Christ, my wounds have been healed. I, sin leaves a mark, and so you st still may have some scars, but the wounds have been healed. The filth of my sin has been cleansed. It's been washed. Though my sins were as scarlet, they are as white as snow. That's expiation and you may be here today and man you your your sin resume may be really long you're ashamed of it you wouldn't want anybody to know maybe there's stuff on your resume that you would never show anybody else Christ knows it's there and he died on a cross not only to satisfy God's wrath but to cure your woundedness Come to Him. Embrace Him by faith. Love Him. Worship Him. Repent of that sin. You may carry around the scars the rest of your life. Jesus had scars after the cross. But those wounds are healed. And He can heal your wounds as well. The cross absorbs the judgment of God. Secondly, the cross makes God accessible to sinners. Look at verse 45. The end of verse 45 says this. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus on the cross for six hours. The first three hours facing unjust treatment by hateful men. The second three hours facing the judgment and the wrath of a holy God. And somewhere in the middle of that, a few hundred yards away in the temple, the curtain that separates the holy of holies from the sinfulness of man is ripped into. Around this same time, around 5 o'clock p.m., there would have been tens of thousands of lambs that were about to be slaughtered 
in the temple. The whole world goes dark. The temple is ripped from top to bottom, signifying God did this. Man didn't rip it from bottom to up. If you're trying to reconcile a relationship with God going from bottom to up, good luck with that. It's got to start at the top. God initiates. He rips it from top to bottom, giving sinful people access to a holy God. You see, that holy place on the other side of that curtain was the holiest of all holy places. It represented the only place where man could meet with God on planet earth. And the high priest could only go in there one day a year. And as soon as he got in there, he wanted to get out as quick as he could because he was in the holy presence of God. And he knew he was not holy. And yet as Jesus died on that cross, do you know what happened? Jesus ripped the curtain and created divine access for sinful man to enter into the holy place. This is what we call reconciliation. Look at this verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. You are absolutely incapable of crawling to God or walking to God or running to God. You are completely dependent as an unrighteous person for the righteous person to bring you to God. And that's what Jesus did for us. In that temple, what happened when that curtain was torn is described in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Do you understand why the curtain was ripped? Jesus went in there, and when he came out, he declared there is no longer a separation. Jesus went into the holy place. Listen, not as the high priest he went in there as the Lamb of God. He came out as the high priest. That's why Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 says, For by a single offering he has perfected, past tense, for all time, future tense, those who are being sanctified, present tense. That's an incredible verse. Do you understand what happened at the cross? Jesus did exactly what the cross was designed for. He perfected us for all time. Who did he perfect? Those who are still currently being, present tense, sanctified. It's an amazing mystery why God would put up with any of us while we are still incomplete in our sanctification and yet absolutely complete in our justification because of what Christ did in ripping the separation between a holy God and a holy man. The cross of Christ is God's only means of salvation. Look at verse 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus used his last breath to shout, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. As soon as those around the cross heard those words, they knew he was quoting Scripture. Psalm 31 verse 5. And yet Jesus stopped. He truncated the verse. Do you know how the verse ends? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me. Why did he quote the rest of the verse? Because Jesus didn't need to be redeemed. He was being the redeemer. As soon as they heard Psalm 31, 5, they knew exactly what it was. This was the bedtime prayer for every good Hebrew boy and girl, they would say their nightly prayers and they would say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The whole verse. Do you understand? 
that in Jesus saying that, he modeled for us the only way for the cross to have any effect on our lives? How does the cross have effect on us? It is simply this. We must commit our lives into the hands of the Father. Have you, will you, today commit or recommit your life into the hands of the Father? And what you're saying is, I'm taking my hands off of my life and I'm committing my life into the hands, the controlling, protecting hands of Father God. The same hands that nailed Jesus to the cross. The same hands that the Son of God had nailed to the cross. Do you trust those hands? Will you fully commit, trust, your whole life, all your thoughts, all your past, all your present, all your future, all your money, all your power, all your influence, will you commit your hands or your life into the hands of the Father? That's what Jesus did with his final breath, modeling for us how the cross saves. Now, not only how the cross saves, but quickly, who the cross saves. I want you to notice some characters again here. First of all, notice the cross of Christ saves outsiders. We're introduced in verse 47 to an outsider. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. So the, centur the centurion saw what had taken place. A centurion was a Roman soldier. He was a man who was in charge of 100 other Roman soldiers. This centurion had watched Jesus for the last 15 hours. Flashback 15 hours ago, Judas leads this centurion along with hundreds of Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus. When they get there, they ask, who is this man? And Jesus, do you remember what he said? John records what he says. He said, I am the Christ. And it immediately resulted in everybody falling flat backwards. That's how powerful the voice of Jesus was. The centurion saw that happen. And then when they got back up, they went to arrest Jesus. And what did Peter do? Pulls out a sword and cuts off the ear of one of this man's soldiers. Jesus graciously picks up the ear and heals that man, puts it back on, refuse, refuses to fight. He's drug off to the trial before Caiaphas. He's drug off to the trial before Pilate. He watches Christ nailed to the cross at his own order. If there was ever a man for whom it could be said he killed Jesus, it was this centurion. He was giving the orders to whip his back. He was giving the orders to nail his hands. He was giving the orders for him to be lifted up and thrown, that, for that cross to be thrown into the hole. This was the centurion that watched what had taken place. He watched Jesus grant forgiveness to a criminal, and then he heard Jesus pray this prayer, Father, forgive them, all of them, all of the centurions, even, even that centurion, forget, Father, forgive, forgive them. The centurion watched all of that. He had never seen a criminal crucified like that before. Jesus was different, and he watched the difference. And as Jesus took his final breath, that centurion said, this man was innocent. It's the first step in a profession of faith. It's recognizing the innocence, the purity, the fact that Jesus was holy, he was righteous. 
And if he understood that Jesus was righteous, he was also now gaining an understanding that he was guilty. And he had crucified an innocent man. The same thing that happened in his heart has to happen in every one of our hearts to understand that Jesus was innocent and we are guilty. Jesus is holy. I am unholy. And this was the first convert to Christ at the cross. He praised God. It's an example that no matter how far from God you are, you can be saved. This was a centurion. He wasn't a Jew. He didn't hear Jesus preach. He didn't follow Jesus in Galilee. He didn't have any access to the Old Testament passages predicting the coming of Jesus. He just watched Jesus for 15 hours and it made such an impression on him that he committed his life to follow Jesus. Yet he was an outsider. Verse 48 says, there's another group, and all the crowds that assembled for this spectacle, the word spectacle there, it's the only time it's used in all of Scripture because the crucifixion of Christ was one of a kind. When they saw what had taken place, just like the centurion saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. It's a strange tradition, right? I mean, we don't do this much anymore, do we? Why did they do that? Remember, the whole world had been in darkness for three hours. They weren't mocking anymore. They weren't cheering anymore. They were feeling the weight of guilt, knowing they had crucified an innocent man. Unpardoned guilt causes you to want to punish yourself. Causes you to want to beat yourself up knowing that sin has a price tag and it needs to be punished. And if you don't go to the cross where Jesus was beaten up for your beh- on, on your behalf, then you will have a tendency to beat yourself up for your own guilt. Sin wants to shame you. Sin and guilt wants to beat you up. This crowd's interesting. We don't really know who was in that crowd, just generally. We, we anticipate it's the same people that, that had cried days before, or actually hours before, crucify him, crucify him. Luke's gospel is about to end here in the next chapter, but Luke wrote a second book. It's called the, gospel, or it's called the, the Acts. In the second chapter, after Jesus has risen from the dead, there's a preacher there. It's one of the followers of Jesus. His name was Peter. And he preached a little sermon publicly to the crowds. I believe that many of the crowds that were at the cross that were beating themselves up eventually made their way under the preaching of Peter, and this is what Peter said to them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? Peter looked at him and says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And the scripture records that over 3,000 of them were saved. They went from beating themselves up to understanding that Jesus had taken the beating for them and they committed their lives to Christ. They repented and they were baptized. Can I ask you, have you done that? Or are you still beating yourself up? Listen, the cross has done everything necessary to secure and guarantee the salvation of all who will commit their lives to Him. And if you are secure in Christ, you don't ever have to let another beating take place. Jesus is taking the beating for you. Verse 49 introduces us to some more outsiders and all his acquaintances and the women who also followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. You understand that women were second class citizens back in those days and yet one of the amazing things about the gospel of Luke, if you've been following, Luke continues to elevate the role of godly women. Thirteen different accounts of women that Luke shares in positive light that are neglected in the other Gospels. The cross of Christ saves not only outsiders, but insiders. We're going to 
introduced to an insider. Verse 50 says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he looked, took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a, in a tomb cut in a stone where no one had ever been laid. So we're introduced to this man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was a religious man. He was a religious leader. He was Jewish. He likely knew all of the Old Testament scriptures, much of it being memorized. He was well-behaved. He was always around holy things. And yet, Matthew tells us he was a secret disciple. Now, the Bible's not a big fan of secret disciples. You need to come public with your faith. This is the point at which Joseph courageously and boldly declared he was a follower of Jesus. He went to Pilate at the risk of his life and identified himself with the man Jesus, took him off the cross, laid him in his own borrowed tomb. Why would he do that? We might say, well, he, he probably felt guilty for being a secret disciple. Maybe this was the point at which he really wanted to boldly declare he was a follower. You know the ultimate reason Joseph took Jesus' body and buried it in his tomb? Because of God's providence that orchestrated the whole thing, predicted back in Isaiah 53, 700 years ago, it tells us that he made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Joseph was the rich man predicted that would come and bury the body of Jesus 700 years before. He was looking to the kingdom. He understood the kingdoms of this world are useless. He was living for a greater kingdom. He'd heard the criminal be promised that today you will be with me in paradise, in my kingdom. Listen, last point here. The cross saves only those who will commit their lives to Jesus. The cross declares that there's no one so bad they can't be saved. And the cross of Christ declares there's no one so good they must not be saved. The cross is for insiders and outsiders. I don't know who you most identify with, but understand this. The point is we are saved by grace, not because of our religious performance and good behavior, not just because you're a dirty, rotten sinner and an outcast, but by grace we come to the cross for the propitiation of our sin, the redemption through His blood, the expiation, the reconciliation that we can enter into, the holiness of God if we will commit our lives into the hands of the Father. If you've never done that, at the end of this service, there's going to be pastors and counselors down front. Why don't you come to them and say, I am so interested in having my sin washed and healed and cleansed. Help me do that. And if you've done that, do it again. Recommit this week to live a life that is worthy of the death of Christ. Jesus never wanted us to forget what he suffered on our behalf. And for that reason, he gave us these two symbols. I want you to take out that little kit, pull out that little piece of bread. On the night before Jesus was arrested, he gathered his followers around and he predicted what was about to happen. It shows us that Jesus was in complete control through every moment. He took out a piece of bread and he said, guys, I want you to understand, my body's about to be broken. And this bread represents my body that is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. The blood that is shed for for you. 
as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to pay the price for all of our sin. God, I pray that that power of remembrance, the power that was available for us at the cross would be on display this week. Every time we're tempted to get angry, every time we're tempted to lust, every time we're tempted to worry or fear, I pray that you'd remind us of a better kingdom that we are citizens of. Because of the cross, our debt has been paid. Thank you that you made Jesus both Lord and Christ, our propitiation, our expiation. Thank you for the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.